Okay, Revelation chapter 10. I saw another strong angel coming down out of heaven, clothed with a cloud, and the rainbow was upon his head, and his face was like the sun, and his feet like pillars of fire. And he had in his hand a little book which was open. He placed his right foot on the sea and his left on the land, and he cried out with a loud voice as when a lion roars. And when he had cried out, the seven peals of thunder uttered their voices. When the seven peals of thunder had spoken, I was about to write, and I heard a voice from heaven saying, Seal up the things which the seven peals of thunder have spoken, and do not write them. Then the angel whom I saw standing on the sea and on the land lifted up his right hand to heaven, and swore by him who lives forever and ever, who created heaven and the things in it, and the earth and the things in it, and the sea and the things in it, that there will be delay no longer. But in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, which he is about to sound, then the mystery of God is finished, as he preached to his servants the prophets. Then the voice which I heard from heaven I heard again speaking with me and saying, Go, take the book which is open in the hand of the angel, who stands on the sea and on the land. So I went to the angel, telling him to give me the little book. And he said to me, Take it and eat it. It will make your stomach bitter, but in your mouth it will be sweet as honey. I took the little book out of the angel's hand and ate it, and in my mouth it was sweet as honey. And when I had eaten it, my stomach was made bitter. And they said to me, You must prophesy again concerning many peoples and nations and tongues and kings. Okay, so this is an interlude where John has more of an active role. Of the Greek and everything. Okay. He's eating books. Who's eating books? That's happened before. John. Right. Or a little scroll, as my Bible says. Yep. Know, which probably a scroll made of papyrus would go down better. Because it doesn't water will make it dissolve kind of ish. Whereas parchment made from animal skin, if it gets wet, it turns back into skin. Right. <laughs> it's kind of gross. Yeah. So. All right. That's where that went. Okay. So we saw... The easiest one to always go back to is the seven seals, the seven seal judgments, so the four horsemen of the apocalypse and all that. So like we saw after those things happened, um, we had an interlude between the next set of judgments, the seven trumpet angels, which we're still not done with. We still got one trumpet yet to sound. Uh, but then you had this interlude, and then that vision started, and now we have another interlude. Uh, which is going to go on. You're going to have this vision of the mighty angel, and then you'll have this vision where he sees the two witnesses. And we'll see that the purpose of this interlude is to focus on the mission of the church, which is the mission of the church throughout the post-ascension of Christ era. All right, so God's protection on the church. Um, so we're not going to hear about any judgments for right now. So we get, a re we get a relief in the nasty things happening, and we just get to see some bizarre stuff going on. Okay, so another mighty angel. Uh, this time it's not angel. Uh, mighty is a really cool word. Sometimes you have, there's a couple words for mighty in Greek. One is uh, where we get the word mega. Like this is like a mega phone, mega phone, big noise, right? Uh, megalos is a description for something big. In this case, it's um, uh, is kairos is the word, uh, mighty. So not just huge, but powerful. Uh, some people do interpret this as being an actual angel. Uh, this time, it probably isn't. Uh, because you look at the way he's described, and we'll talk about that. This is this is Jesus that's being described. So this is this is Christ, the powerful, the glorified. Um, plus, you will see that it looks like the angel is the one that's guiding the events that are happening. Usually, when you see the angel taking over uh, direct control of events, then you know it's not just an angel. It's actually Jesus they're talking about. Now, one of the things with Revelation is nothing is what it seems. It's usually, uh, if it's not outright in a kind of code using Old Testament images, uh, it's just deliberately obtuse because it's a style of writing called apocalyptic literature, which is what 
you get the name Apocalypse, which is where uh, Revelation comes from. Okay. Um, and that was done, number one, because Jews love apocalyptic literature. That was their favorite kind of literature. They, that was the, um, the exciting action, science fiction, slash fantasy literature of the day. So you think of like Lord of the Rings, first century style, that's what this is. Um, on the other hand, this is, this is uh, divinely inspired apocalyptic writing, so it all has actual meaning, real meanings, and it's all clothed in the language of the Old Testament, uh, so which all these people knew. We don't anymore, like we they used to. Like they just would hear these visions, go, "That's in, that's in Daniel, and that was in Isaiah." Uh, we go, "Yeah, it's in something." I got to look at my notes. So, uh, so it's bizarre to us, and that's why people make it into what it's not, which is uh, a, a manual for doomsday, which. It is and it isn't. I mean, the world only ends like six times in this book, so it's not like it ends more than once. It it's cyclical. It it keeps telling, and every time it tells the story, it gets a little bigger. That's a, a John thing. I'll talk to you after if you've ever looked at the ones online where I put all these when we get done with the recordings. You can listen to the first one, gives you some background on Revelation, and it kind of tells you, okay, this is how you're supposed to listen to and interpret this kind of writing. So anyway. So this is Jesus doing this stuff in this chapter, right? Because he's the one that accomplishes the mission of the church. He works through us today to accomplish his mission. It's his mission. It's never our mission. Uh, so it only makes sense that we see him leading in this vision, uh, leading the way. He's the one that's mighty because he's the one that has defeated sin and death and the devil. Now he rules over all things. So of course, he is going to be the mighty one. So there in verse 1 describes him as being wrapped in a cloud, uh, which is another giveaway that this is Christ, because in the Old Testament, God's presence among his people was often associated with a cloud, right? The pillar of cloud that they followed, the glory cloud that came down over the tabernacle and uh, was the presence of God then, uh, which is also the pre-incarnate Christ, because anytime God manifests physically in the Old Testament, that's the second person of the Trinity. He's not Jesus yet, because he's not a man yet, but that's the second person of the Trinity. Anytime God manifests in the physical realm, second person of the Trinity. Uh, so you have the glory cloud, and that's all over Exodus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, all through those books, through those histories. All right, so now the God-man, the second person of the most holy Trinity, comes down out of heaven. It's only natural that he'd be wrapped in a cloud. Christ comes in glory with a rainbow over his head. Well, gee, what's the rainbow mean? Gay rights. Yeah. It's okay. With that. Okay, so what's the rainbow mean? God's covenant. God's covenant, not to destroy the world by flood again. I got to. I I I love teaching little ones. Every now and then, I get to sneak into the Sunday school room, and they were doing the flood, and they're getting to the rainbow, and it's like, hey, why'd God pick a rainbow? You're like, hmm, I don't know, because they're pretty. It's like, well, yeah, they're pretty, but how did the flood happen? What happened? It rained for 40 days. Good. Had it ever rained before? And they're like, well, didn't it? I'm like, no. If we look back here, it says God watered the garden by the water coming up the earth. It's like, hey, he gave us the rainbow because when that flood started, that was the first time it had ever rained on earth and it destroyed the world. So every time it's going to rain after that, we're going to be like, it's happening again. No, 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 rainbow. We're, oh, okay. Because it had never rained before. So that had been terrifying, right? It's like, oh, water coming up from the ground. That's okay. That would freak us out. Okay, so the rainbow always is associated with God and his covenant with us. Um, not only is Christ coming to, with glory, but his promise is not to destroy. He is coming to save. Uh, even though for the unbelievers, it's not going to look like that, right? But he's coming to save. He's coming in glory and power to save, not to destroy, right? And the mission of the church is to proclaim the gospel of Christ to the world, that sinners be brought to saving faith in him. The church does not proclaim this message to destroy, right? We do it to give life, eternal life. I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. And then again in verse 1, his face was like the sun, 
and his legs were like pillars of fire. We saw that in Revelation chapter 1, verses 15 and 16. All right? The appearance of Christ as the Son of Man is very similar to the way his appearance is described here, on purpose, because it's Jesus. Um, plus, the holiness of God is usually, is not usually, is often depicted in terms of fire. Fire uh, being the burning bush, right? Uh, the pillar of fire, pillar cloud, pillar of fire, uh, which are by most Lutheran theologians are going to say that is a the theophany, that is appearance of the second person of the Trinity manifesting in the physical world. So that's the Son of God, pre-incarnate Christ. Uh, also, that same language brings back the idea of when Moses was in the presence of God, he came down the mountain, his face was like glowing, right? So it brings back that uh, kind of thought. Uh, his face shone and his hair had turned white. Right. Uh, this language might also point back to the transfiguration when Jesus' face was transfigured and it shone like the sun. Okay, so long story short, this mighty angel is Jesus. Okay, verse 2, he had a little scroll open in his hand. That scroll points back now to Revelation 5, the scroll, the book of the seven seals. Right? Christ was the only one worthy to break the seals on that and open the scroll. This little scroll is the same scroll. Okay, so this is the book of the seven seals. It's the same scroll. It contains the things that are necessary to come about, as it said before. All right, so this is the same scroll. Do you remember what I said that scroll was? Yeah, it's the book of the seven seals. It's got the four horsemen. That book, that book is about what? What is that book about? The revealing. Didn't you say that's where we revelate that we get revelation for the revealing? Well, that's what this book is about, the, the yeah. book of Revelation. But that, that book with the seven seals is a book about us. It's our story. So that's, I wouldn't call it the book of life, which has everybody's name recorded in it. That's a different book. But this is the book of the history of man, the history of our world. Because that's what it shows. And it shows these all these different visions. That vision shows us from Jesus' ascension till he comes again, this is what the world's going to look like. You're going to see famine and fire and war and tyranny and blah, 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 right? Uh, so it's the same scroll. This is the story of mankind, right? It has all the things that are necessary to come about. It's got our whole history is in there, which makes sense that Jesus has the scroll because he's the one who wrote it, right? So everything in the tribulation is in that scroll. And again, the tribulation is not some end times thing. We're in the end times now. The end times began when Jesus ascended. The end times will end when he comes back. So that whole thing, that's the tribulation. There's not some magical seven years or 40 months or whatever, three years, whatever numbers they come up with. It's till Jesus comes back, this is the, this is the great tribulation. And everything in this book is about that tribulation. This is what it's going to look like till he comes back. Uh, but they will talk a little bit about what it'll be like right before the end when it gets really, really bad, and we'll talk about that. We haven't got to that yet. Okay, so verse 2 and 3, and he sets his right foot on the sea and his left foot on the land. And it calls out with a loud voice like the roar of a lion. Okay, so the sea and the land, of course, symbolizes all of creation, right? Christ rules over everything. Um, and then the judgments that we've already seen, the descriptions, we've seen things that focus on the sea or the land or the sea and the land or the heavens and the land, uh, which just reminds us that these things are going to affect all of creation, right? The earth is affected, the fresh water is affected, the salt water is affected, the sky is affected, the motions of the heavenly bodies are affected. So everything is tied up in this. All right, so Christ strides over the sea and the land, indicating his figurative great size because he's over and above everything. His omnipresence, right? He's everywhere at once. Um, his size also uh, indicates the importance of his mission for which he comes to fulfill. So he dominates everything on earth. 
no one has power to resist him. No one can um, keep him from fulfilling the mission he sets out to achieve. Uh, the gates of hell will not stand against his church, Matthew 16, 18. So when he speaks, it's described as the roar of a lion, uh, indicating that this is the voice of God himself. Christ is the lion of Judah, right? Uh, as he was prophesied to be the, before he was born. So his voice is authoritative over everything. Okay, and then verses 3 and 4, the seven thunders sounded. Uh, God's voice is often depicted as the sound of thunder. See Exodus 19, 16 for an example. Um, so his voice is majestic, it's holy, it's powerful. It is so much so that sinners can't bear to hear it. Right? When uh, Moses was up on the mountain and he took the elders of the tribe up there with him, right? You know, they didn't go right into the presence of God, but you know, God was there. And they heard thunder and they said, you know, yeah, you, Moses, you go up there and do this because this is too much for us. We can't bear to even hear it, all right? So that, that happened on the mountain so that Moses was the only one that could go into the presence. All right, so as Christ speaks, the Father's perfect voice accompanies his because he and the Father are one. They share the same mission. Uh, the seven thunders, oh, what are the seven thunders? That sounds like something that means something. Yeah, not really. So there's that number seven again, right? So number seven, that which only God can do, has done, or will do, right? So that's God's number, the perfect number. Uh, so the seven thunders, that would be the voice that only, things that only God can do, will do, can do. That's God's voice. Seven thunders, voice like seven thunders, God's voice without a doubt. Okay, and then verse 4, I was about to write, uh, nope, seal that up, don't write it down. Man, everybody, there's, I mean, there's people that have written all kinds of stuff about that because, you know, how intriguing is that? I want to know what that is. Yeah, we're not meant to know what that is. Every time we ask for forbidden knowledge, we get in really big trouble. Don't do that. Don't talk to snakes. Don't eat forbidden fruit. Don't seek forbidden knowledge. Forbidden knowledge is bad. Okay, so... Some interpreters have all kinds of fun with this, claiming that the voice of the seven thunders spoke something very secret uh, that's not to be revealed to the world, but that doesn't keep them from speculating what it is. Um, so you can imagine what kind of stuff they could have come up with, right? But that's not what is happening here. John's not told... John is not told to seal up and not write down what they said because um, there's something to hide. Because God's got, oh, that's something? No, you shouldn't have heard that, right? Rather, because this is the unveiled and perfect voice of God. And no one can record that, even exactly what he said. Um, no one can bear to hear it. So whatever the Father utters, we're too sacred and too holy for us to hear yet. Uh, anyone that's still on earth can't hear it, can't understand, can't take it in. Uh, it's too sacred. It's too beautiful. Only those who enter the eternal rest in the kingdom can hear such things. Uh, which is even that is a little bit of speculation. How do we get that from the text? Mm. Maybe a little bit of the opposite of, well, I'm not going to speculate what it says, but it's just because whatever God said was just too beautiful for us and we can't hear it. Well, that, yeah, there's things we're, we're not meant to hear. Regardless of what this, because so this is one of those times where it's like, well, what does that, what does it mean? Is it something secret? Is it going to be revealed later? Or is it not meant for us? Then why would he make a point of it? Ah, now we're getting to how to interpret. Well, this is intriguing. We all want to know what some thunder said, but... Why would he even record it then if he wasn't supposed to write it down? Or he's like, oh, I was going to write this stuff down, but then they told me not to. Well, then why do you include that detail? That he heard these things and he didn't write it down. Why? Okay, well, it's because it's a warning. Again, it's a warning not to delve into the mysteries of God, which he himself has not revealed to us. So whatever was said, he's chosen not to reveal that to us for our own good. So 
there's things he hasn't told us about himself. And everything we need to know about him, he has revealed here. And so we have to be satisfied with that. So, I mean, what's it? How old are we going to be when we get to heaven? Are we going to be in the prime of our lives or are we going to be the same age as when we died? I don't know. It's fun to speculate. God hasn't revealed that to us because we don't need to know because it's not important. Right, that's a dumb example, but it's a question we've all probably asked at one time. So what's in the scroll? I don't know. God said it's not for us to know right now. That's good enough. He hadn't revealed it. So there's simply some things he hasn't told us, and we shouldn't try to decipher things he hasn't shown us using our sinful human reason because we're human and we're sinful. Right? Where did God come from? Who made God? What? Why do we ask stuff like that? You know, how can God predestine the saved, but not at the same time responsible for predestining the damned? Okay, that was one of the little meteor to choose up, chew on. Well, if God predestines some for salvation, how does he not predest, predestine those other people to damnation? Which I'm not getting into the doctrine of election today, but uh, we don't believe that we don't believe that some are predestined. No matter, no matter how strong their faith is, God predestined them to go to hell, so they go to hell. We don't believe that. That's double predestination. Um, that's more of a Calvinist thing. Uh, but how? How? Why? How, we get that from Scripture that He doesn't do that. But but how? Why? Why? Because He's God, and it's not meant for us to know. So quit asking. So we'll know when we get there. You know how can God be human and divine at the same time? You know, how can Christ give us his real, physical, actual flesh and blood to eat and drink in the Holy Supper, even though I can't see it? I don't know, because he said so. Because he's God. You know, the more you, trouble you get in questioning these things, the more you deviate from what Scripture actually says, which is, take, eat, this is my body, and take, drink, this is my blood. Right? Uh, but that's all this little couple verses is about. It's like, oh yeah, here's some stuff. There's stuff that's not going to be revealed to you. Faith, right? So don't stick your nose into it. You're supposed to have faith. Yeah, just have faith that he knows what he's doing. How about that? Imagine God might know what he's doing. <laughs> but how often do we were like, well, you know, I think God's sleeping on the job because bad things happened. And, well, I'm a nice person. Well, no, you're not. You deserve nothing but eternal torment and death. But, but okay, you keep thinking that, that God's picking on you. It's not how it works. But we have to we have to anthropomorphize God because he's God. I mean, think about that a minute. Now I'm going off on a tangent, philosophical tangent. But as we say in the Apostles' Creed, when we say, you know, uh, you know, and, uh, you know, Christ became man, now uh, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being in one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made. That by whom all things were made is not referring to the Father, by the way. It's referring to the Son. Because the Son is the divine Logos, the Word, the Word made flesh, the Word of God, whatever God speaks, that's Jesus. So the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, as John says. So Jesus spoke pre before he was Jesus, when he was the Son, the second person in Trinity, spoke the universe into existence. Before he spoke the universe into existence, which includes all of time and space, there was God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in perfect communion together. And there was no time and space. What's that like? I don't know. I guess you have to be God to understand that. And then he created time and space. And we are creatures of time and space. And we only perceive time running in one direction. So we're real limited in our sensation of how we can try to describe God. How do you describe something that's outside of time and space? Yeah, we do, and, and that's that's the thing, is stop trying to understand that. I can't understand the money God. No, you can't. You're never going to. Even when we're in heaven and perfect, you're still not going to understand God, because he's God, <laughs> right? So we, But we try to make God into a person, because that's how the way we can relate to him, which is why Jesus had to become a person to save us all. That's a whole other discussion. All right, so this is Jesus, the mighty angel. This is Jesus in total control of what's going on. Then you have, and this is, I'm going to wind up taking the whole hour on this little chapter. There's so much stuff going on in Revelation that it's just, so, okay, so you seal up, 
And the angel stands on him and says, and swore by him who lives forever and ever. So this is the oath that is, this oath is that in the days of the trumpet call of the seventh angel, the seventh angel, the seventh trumpet angel, who we haven't seen yet, he hasn't blown his trumpet. We've only had six. John loves to do this. So here's here's like six seals, and then oh yeah, we're going to do something else for a while. We'll come back to the seventh seal, and then oh, the seventh seal just opened up all these trumpet angels. Well, here's the first six trumpets, and then, oh yeah, we're going to stop there, and we're going to do some other stuff, and then we'll get back to the seventh trumpet. So his oath that he's swearing by the one who lives forever and ever is that in the days of the trumpet call of the seventh angel, the mystery of God will be revealed. Just as he announced to his slaves, the prophets. And I use the word slave uh, because uh, I believe it's the word doulos in Greek. Usually gets translated in the NASB. I believe it's translated bondservant. In ESV, it's translated in Lutheran study Bible, it's going to be translated as servant. In the old King James, I think it might have actually been slave, but I'm not sure. A bond servant's a better translation. So why do all these different English translations translate that Greek word differently? So it means, because it can mean servant, slave, or bond servant, which are all different things. You get to pick. Uh, NASB is a little bit more literal translation, so it's going to pick bond servant because it's closest to that meaning. ESV is a little less literal, but it's still really literal. Then you're going to go to NIV, which is less literal, and it's going to have like servant or something weaker. Uh, and we don't like the word slave because we're Americans and it has baggage. But bond servant means you owe a debt, and when the debt's paid, you're free. Which, yeah, and guess what? That's what the prophets were. They were bond servants. They had a debt, and when the debt was paid, they were freed. And when my debt was, is paid, I'll be free. When your debt is paid, it'll be free. It's, oh, yeah, but Jesus dying and rising again was what paid the debt. So we're still bond servants because we're still here. We're still sinful. It won't be, the debt's paid, but we're not going to be released until we're perfected in paradise. So bond servant or slave. That went off on another tangent. So, uh, in other words, this oath is that all things will be accomplished according to the divine plan and that everyone will know it. All right, it's going to be no miscommunication on the last day. At the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow, Philippians 2.10. Those two things go hand in hand. Christ is vowing he will return on the last day, just as he promised, and that all will be revealed as his word proclaims and fulfilling everything that the prophets foretold. Uh, which is a lot. Right? And, and the ends of these sevenfold visions, the world always ends. Because yeah, you can just see lightning, flashes of thunder, earthquake, and everything. Poof, that's the end of the world. And then we start a new vision from a different perspective, which is why this book is so weird. Is you have three sevenfold visions, and you have all these interlude visions, and at the end of every one, the world ends. And that's how people get Jesus coming back more than once, like the secret rapture. Like, well, there's a rapture, but then Jesus secretly comes back for a little while, and then he goes away again, and then the devil's set loose, and then he comes back for real. Like, how do you get that? Oh, because they read it like a book. And then this happens, and then this happens, and then this happens. It's not, it's repeating. The world ends, and then the world ends, and then the world ends, and then the world ends. It's the way John writes, um, which is also, it's like a Quentin Tarantino movie. Some stuff's out of order. Uh, it seems like the end's at the beginning, and the beginning's at the end, Right? Uh, it's not quite like that, but it's pretty weird. And it's a good way to think about apocalyptic literature is where things are just strange. Like, you can't read it as linear time. You will get in big trouble. You'll get Jesus coming back more than once. Uh, you'll have, that's how you wind up with like a literal thousand year reign of Christ on earth. It's like, no, when he comes back, that's the that last day. He can't come back and not have a last day. But that's how you get that stuff, is reading this like a linear story. That gets you in big, big trouble. So, uh, anyhow. So, the whole idea of swearing, this his oath he takes, is that, yeah, all my promises are going to be fulfilled. But then we have in verses 8 to 11, before that day, his prophets will continue to prophesy in his name. What prophets? I don't have any prophets. Do we have prophets? I'm a prophet. I'm, I'm your prophet. 
So prophets, prophecy is not telling the future. Prophecy is speaking the word of God. That's what a prophet is. Sometimes they tell the future, especially in days of old. They would predict the future. Usually the prediction wasn't too hard to predict. It was, hey, you, people of God, if you don't turn from your evil ways and stop sinning, you're going to get conquered by these other kingdoms, and God's not going to do anything about it because you deserve it because you suck. <laughs> and that's exactly what happens. The prophets go, see, and then they kill the prophet. <laughs> And then eventually they, everything comes around again and they start sinning again and God sends a new prophet and the same thing happens and they try to kill him. So old school prophet, not a good job. New school prophet, not bad. I just get to proclaim Christ to you guys and it's like everything's awesome. Uh, don't predict the future. Predicting the future is bad. Some of them try to predict the future. Yeah, those guys, are, well it, for them. those guys are idiots. It's like, are you predicting the future to earn a living? Because the prophets of old that prophesied the future, they didn't do so good for themselves. Anyhow. <coughs> so, those who continue to prophesy in his name, which, how does he say that? Yeah, take the book that is open on the hand of angels, stands on the sea and land, which is the book about us. Right? And then take it and eat it, and we'll get to Okay, so now we're going to get to it. All right, so uh, everyone who's called into the office of the holy ministry, pastors, uh, are to preach his word, which is preaching repentance to the forgiveness of sins, and that is done by Christ crucified and risen for you. All right, the motto of my seminary is Kirazan Ton Logon, which is preach the word, which is from uh, 2 Timothy 4.2. Preach the word, be ready in season, out of season, reprove rebuke, exhort, and with complete patience and teaching. Um, so that is what a prophet does. That's what a pastor does. So now Jesus says, take this book, eat it. All right, so the eating of the little book points back to Ezekiel chapter 3, which is where the first place that happens. So let's look at Ezekiel chapter 3, because that's a neat story. Ezekiel's got neat stories. Ezekiel, Daniel... Chapter 3. We're going to want to go back about a little more than halfway. Ish. Get through that. So, Ezekiel chapter 3. Why can I not read my own notes today? They're even typed. Because I spelled out the word number 3. That's why. Okay. All right. So, this is when Ezekiel first gets commissioned. All right, so this is like God comes down and goes, okay, Ezekiel, you're ordained. Go forth and do. All right, so Ezekiel chapter 3. It says, then he said to me, son of man, eat what you find. Eat the scroll. Go speak to the house of Israel. You got it? Yes, find it? yes I do. Uh, so I opened my mouth and he fed me this scroll. He said to me, son of man, feed your stomach and fill your body with a scroll, which I am giving to you. Then I ate it and it was sweet as honey in my mouth. And he said to me, son of man, go to the house of Israel and speak with my words to them. For you are not being sent to a people of unintelligible speech or difficult language, but to the house of Israel, nor to many peoples of unintelligible speech or difficult language whose words you can't understand. But I've sent you to them who should listen to you. Yet the house of Israel will not be willing to listen to you, since they are not willing to listen to me. Surely the whole house of Israel is stubborn and obstinate. Behold, I have made your face as hard as their faces, and your forehead as hard as their foreheads. Like emery, harder than flint, I have made your forehead. Don't be afraid of them, or be dismayed, though they are a rebellious house. Moreover, he said to me, Son of man, take into your heart all my words, which I will speak to you, and listen closely. Go to the exiles, to the sons of your people, and speak to them, and tell them, whether they listen or not, thus says the Lord God. Oh, and then the Spirit of God lifts him up and goes, okay, you're here, go to work. All right, so again, the glory of the Lord, right? Why does it say glory of the Lord for I can fool myself? Oh, Spirit of the Lord. Yep, so the glory of the Lord, every time you see the glory of the Lord, that's also the pre-incarnate Christ, that's a theophany. Uh, we could do a whole Bible study of just appearances of Christ in the Old Testament. It would probably take a year. Um, so the angel of the Lord basically gives Ezekiel the scroll. Right here, Jesus gives John 
the last prophet, if you will, the scroll, the last prophet that wrote inspired scripture. So John is to fully digest the word of God, right? So that he can then boldly speak it to the world. Um, so it's sweet going down, not so much coming back up high. So it's sweet on the tongue like honey going in, but then when it's in the stomach, it's bitter. Why is it bitter? The word of God should be awesome. And it is awesome, but why is it bitter? Probably not a great outcome or something that we're not going to want to hear. Yeah. Like I said, prophet got a good job. Okay, hey, Jeremiah, for example. Here's what I want you to do, and I'm going to tell you ahead of time. None of them are going to listen to you, ever. Ever. Every time you go, they're not going to pay attention to what you say. Now go do what I tell you. Yeah, okay, thanks, God. I do that, and he did. But So that's why it's better, because and he, John's hey, it's, it's going to be to you too. You're going to tell people, this is what's going to happen. This is what the world's going to look like till I come back. And they're not going to like what you have to say. Um, it's supposed to be comforting, but they're going to turn it into something else, and then they'll turn it into really something else once TV and movies come around. They turned it into everything but what it's about. So when you when he's giving the word of God back out, it falls on deaf ears, and you take it personal. <laughs> You're not supposed to take it personal. Um, it's not up to you. It's not up to any of us when we share Jesus with somebody to make them believe it. That's not on us. All us is put in the ears because it's the action of it going in the ears that does the work. The spirit works when and where he wills, however he wills. It's not up to us. Just just like the sower, like the parable of the sower. There's so much tied in in Revelation. So, right? The they call it the parable of the sower. I was like, well, you should be like the sower and make sure you sow your seeds on. Nah. God's the sower, right? And he sowed seeds on four different kinds of soils. So then we ask, well, what kind of soil am I? No, also not what it's about. It's God's the sower. And he took his seeds, the word, and he threw it where there's good soil, and he threw it where there's rocks, and he threw it in the middle of the path. He didn't care. He just threw it everywhere. That's the point. The word's supposed to go everywhere. And who cares if they listen or not? Just that the fact that it went, that's what he wants. And then he'll do his thing, we do our thing, and we're good. All right? So that is the church's mission throughout this tribulation that's been going on for 2,000 years and oh, God knows when it'll end to proclaim the whole counsel of God law and gospel God's law that shows us we're sinners gospel that shows us the solution to sin all right, to everyone on earth and the church accomplishes that message through its prophets and pastors and therefore the pastoral office is a prophetic office People like to make differences in the Bible between prophets, apostles, evangelists, teachers, elders, deacons. Um, in the Bible, those are pretty much all synonyms for pastor, basically. Um, though all those that God has chosen to speak on his behalf are united in that same mission. Just like the Old Testament prophets and John are here to speak on God's behalf, Pastors today are supposed to speak a God's word on behalf of his people. Uh, God help you if you don't use God's word. Um, so to be sure, all Christians, all of us, clergy, laity, are united in the mission of the church. Uh, they're all, all of us are called to share the gospel however we can. Uh, but not all Christians are called to the pastoral office. Um, there is always a difference between the priesthood of all believers, which if you're uh, not a long time Lutheran and haven't heard that term before that some Luther uh, started talking about. And you get that when you read Hebrews, how we're all priests to our God now because we don't need these other priests to stand in for us, which means we get to approach God directly with our prayers. Not the same as being a like Roman Catholic priest or a pastor or whatever. Uh, not the same thing. Uh, there's the office of the holy ministry that people are called and ordained to. Um, and that gets blurred more, more and more and more and more, or where we 
blurring the lines between pastor and people, which is not good. It doesn't mean the pastor's better than anybody else. It just means I have a different job than you. That's all that is. Uh, but then when you blur the job, it makes the job hard to do. We don't have that problem like here or any of our local churches that I know of, but, but some places it's like, who's the pastor and who's the people? You can't tell. They're so casual about everything. That's like, who's doing, who's, who's in charge? It's weird. Okay, so turns your stomach sour, uh, but on your tongue it's sweet as honey. So the prophets who have eaten the scroll, who have fully digested the word of God, will suffer for their ministry, right? Uh, because they're doing it in Christ's command instead. The message they have to proclaim does not always make one popular, right? I mean, it's great fun to baptize babies and marry people and forgive people say that God forgives you all your sins on Sunday morning to give you, uh, but when you have to have a conversation with someone who is like um, cohabitating or someone who is um, someone who despite your best counsel goes and has an abortion <laughs> after they get counseling about it, uh, or it's not funny, it's sad. Uh, the, the hard conversations... And when you preach God's truth, even though you know society has basically made all this stuff permissive, it's like, but yeah, go shack up with your boyfriend. I don't care. Oh, your boyfriend's another dude. Or your, boy, your girlfriend's another girl, whatever. Boyfriend's another dude. Well, I, you know what I mean. Um, and, and telling people that that's sinful uh, does not make you popular. Right? Uh, people don't really like that. I mean, they want to, yeah, I know I'm not supposed to do that, but Jesus loves me anyway. And then yeah, but uh, yeah, so that stuff's not fun. So that stuff is sour. That makes you, know, you are not a popular guy. Well, you should don't be so harsh. Like, why you gotta be so harsh? Why you gotta be like that? It's like they're gonna leave the church. Then they leave the church. <laughs> they're one foot out the door anyway because they don't believe. You know, they they don't believe that that's God's word, right? They don't believe it applies to you. All right, so. Eating the scroll does not always bring suffering, uh, but sometimes it does. Uh, the greatest joy for the suffering servants who model their life on Christ badly. We do it badly, really, really badly. But <clears throat> Jesus calls us to be like him, which he came to serve. So we're supposed to serve. And on the last day, you get your reward for remaining steadfast in the word. Uh, and then you will finally taste the honey sweet on the last day of what all that meant. Uh, that's the well done, good and faithful servant. Uh, but till then, yeah. Oh, and not to mention the guilt for not doing your job good. So again, sour, because God's law works on us too. Like, oh yeah, you know, you're a sinner too, dummy. All right, so you must prophesy, prof prophesy, verse 11. Go to the exiles, the son of your people, and speak to them and tell them, prophesy to them and tell them, whether they listen or not, thus says the Lord God. So in Greek, there is this little word, day, um, from deo, which means to bind, to imprison, to constrain, or compel, uh, which often refers to a thing called divine necessity, as it does here. So John is compelled by this divine imperative. Why? Because it's only through the word of God that sinners are brought to faith. That is Romans 10, 17. The mission of the church, uh, the mission of God, God's sending of the Son in the power of the Holy Spirit, accomplished solely through the word of God in our day. Right? If the word's not proclaimed, sinners aren't saved, period. Because the word is what does the work. So John and all pastors have to preach the word, right? They have to have fully digested and proclaim this word. That's the mission of the church. It has to be done throughout the tribulation from Jesus' ascension to his second coming. Uh, it is a divine imperative, this mission. Um, it must be done. So you're, you're bound. Uh, that is why pastors wear stoles, by the way. Why? I thought it was a fashion accessory. So the stole symbolizes a yoke, like an ox would wear, right? And that's a burden, that's a symbol of subordination. So that's what that means. 
but it's light because, you know, Jesus' burden is light, right? Because he's got it. So that, that's the yoke of office. So that means you are compelled. Constrained, bound, enslaved, actually. So, but it's the good kind of slavery. All right, so this whole little chapter that I managed to talk about for 45 minutes uh, is that all pastors are supposed to proclaim the word of God, even though people might not always listen to you, uh, won't listen to you. And that applies for the entire New Testament era, which is us. This is still the New Testament era. Because uh, you're not going to be another testament till the end. So now we're going to look at the second scene of this interlude. That was just the first scene. The second scene is the two witnesses, uh, which are going to show us how God will keep his church and her mission safe. So when we, we have a reinforcement of what Jesus' mission is, what our mission is as his servants. So now we know what the church's mission is. Now we got to know how God is going to keep that safe. Because, you know, the devil and stuff. Uh, so, and we have to know where that, when that little season of Satan starts before Christ's return. How is God going to keep his church safe? Because he says she will always prevail. There's always going to be a remnant. Might not be a big remnant. Doesn't say anything about how big it will be. All right. But we're not going to start that chapter today. And this is uh, this, was, this was a little article written by a pastor named Thomas Messer that I adopted and adapted. Uh, he was also a Lutheran pastor, and uh, I don't even know which of his words are his and which are mine that I added in anymore. I can't actually tell; it's all mashed up. Uh, so just so you know, this guy gave me all the ideas. So there's a lot of there's a lot of confusion today about the mission of the church uh, because we misuse the word mission, probably. Uh, how the church carries out her mission. Uh, even in Lutheran circles, we reduce the mission of the church to simple witnessing. Which, what not that what you just said, that it's telling people about Jesus? Um, yeah. It's part of it. You know, but just telling somebody about Jesus isn't fulfilling the mission. Why? Because we're to make disciples of all nations. How? How do we do that? Two things. Go ye therefore and make disciples of all nations. Baptizing. Them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them all I have commanded you. Right? So baptize and teach. So the goal of the mission is not to fill the pews. Uh, or enlarge our sin, which if that's the case, we're doing great. Because, <laughs> man, how many people were, that actually church was pretty full today church for us. Today. That, that was like, where did all those people come from? There's like three people here, like right before I was like, mm, yeah. I was like, yeah, everybody's here. And Doris was here. So, yeah, it's not about numbers. I have to keep telling ourselves it's not about numbers, even though we want, really want big numbers, but it's to make disciples. Uh, when we focus on increasing the numbers instead of making disciples, then we run the risk of watering down our doctrine because how do you make it more attractive? Well, you know, the whole the whole no gays thing, I mean, you know, that's not very you know, open and accepting because we could get, get people if we just say, oh yeah, that's cool, come on in. Uh, and actually, they're welcome, please come on in. We don't have to take you outside the city gates and stone you to death. We're not Jewish. Um, but when we start watering down doctrine to make it attractive, then you've failed already. You're, you've failed. You, know, you can't, you're changing God's word by doing that. You know, you still got to call a sin a sin. Um, but then you got other people that take it too far and say, well, you know, oh, you know, gay is gay. Like, so have you ever looked at a woman with lust in your heart? That's the same sin, stupid. Like, we're not any better than anybody else. It's the same sexual sin. It's sin. It's still sin. And like, did, you, did you ever, like, steal somebody's potato chip off of their plate? <laughs> That's the same sin. It's all equal, right? It all is a death sentence. You took a pit. Death. I don't make the rules. God did. But, yeah, it's neither here nor there. But when we water down doctrine, 
then we get in trouble. Um, and then when you make these mistakes and you see success because all of a sudden the church is growing and you got more bodies and more bodies usually means more money, which means you get to do other cooler things. And then you get to get you're like, wow, they must be doing something right. Uh, people get deceived thinking that God is rewarding their efforts uh, because uh, he likes what's being done, but God doesn't bless falsehoods, right? He never permits his word to be compromised with the world. And the entire testimony of scriptures clearly shows that, and we've even seen that in Revelation in chapter 3, verse 16. There's a lot of chapter 315 and chapter 316s in the Bible where they're really important, like the uh, first promise of Messiah, Genesis 315, you know, like John 316, right? So just as fun sometimes, go through your Bible and just look at chapter 3, either verse 15 and 16 of every book, and just go, wow, that's really good. I'm going to remember that because it's easy to remember 315, 316. Anyway, in Revelation 316, that was the, the city uh, Laodicea, I think it was, where Jesus said, uh, you know, you are lukewarm and I'm going to spit you out of my mouth. You're neither hot nor cold. I wish you were hot or cold. Uh, the, uh, what looks like success is actually failure. And when you do that, you put souls in jeopardy, right? People come to believe that they're Christians on their way to on their way to heaven because they've gone to church that they like and in which they feel comfortable. That ain't good. It could be good if it's preaching the Bible and and they know that their sins are forgiven for the sake of Christ alone. Um, but if you just go to a church that you like in which people feel comfortable because you've compromised God's word, that ain't good. And they'll find out on the last day that they were Christians in name only. And Jesus getting ready to spit them out. <laughs> and that's not good. Um, and that's serious. So churches that compromised the gospel uh, put souls at risk. And anytime, it, that's why we have to be on our guard. That's why you guys have to double check me. It's like, Pastor, did you say what I think you said this morning? You're supposed to do that. If you say, like, I think he said something that's not too kosher. You're supposed to call me out on that. And I'm supposed to go, you know, I think I misspoke. You're right. That could be taken that way. And I got to, like, retract it, right? Uh, or, no, no, you misunderstood it, and we got to talk about that. And here's what I could have made it clearer or something. But you're supposed to call your pastor out when he says something that's, like, stupid, doctrinally. You know, they're not, inf say, I'm not the Pope. I'm not infallible. <laughs> he's not infallible either. He just thinks he is. But you, you, you can't just say anything you want up there. And, and people got to eat it, right? They got to go, well, I think the Bible actually says that. Hey, you're supposed to call them out on it. Uh, the same thing with you guys. If you guys are believing something that's not right, I got to tell you, try to find a nice way because you can really mess people up if they're listening to some TV preacher. They're like, well, yeah, he says, you know, blah, blah. It's like, no, that's stupid, which is my immediate reaction. I'm like, why are you listening to that? Guy's an idiot. Maybe be a little more tactful. Uh, especially with places that talk about the end times, because there's all kinds of stuff on the radio. Um, or the ones that think that uh, we have to support Israel, because if we don't let them rebuild the temple, Jesus won't come back, because you get that from misreading Revelation. Oh, we got to support Israel, because if the temple's not rebuilt, Jesus is never going to come back, so we have to support them no matter what. No, that's dumb. That's not what the Bible says, but okay. But I need to tell you guys that. I can't let you just go on believing stuff about the Bible that's not true, especially if it affects your belief in how you're saved. Like, I mean, some stuff, like, okay, if you want to believe that, that's fine, but it's not true. Um, anyway. Um, cornerstone, the cornerstone of the church, the foundation on which it's built is Christ, yes is that we are saved for the sake of Christ by faith, through grace, which scripture tells us, alone, period. Everything else is getting in trouble. It's not about you. It's not about me. It's not about our congregation. It is not about our bank account. It's not our knowledge of the Bible. It's none of that stuff. Although all of those things can be pretty cool. But it's all about Jesus. 
You know, Luther said if he had only John 3, 16. All the Bibles in the world exploded, right? They, they got us. They got all of us. They killed almost all of us. They burned almost all the Bibles. And all the couple people are left have is John 3, 16. It's enough. So if you got that, that's all you need. That's the whole gospel in one verse. Actually, two. I like to put 17 with it. Um, that's it. It's all about Jesus. Right? So... It's important that each of us understand that the mission, this mission that the mighty angel is giving John, is that the Holy Spirit makes disciples. And he makes disciples through us. And they come to our church, been great. Praise God, we'll grow a little bit. Um, but that's not the end to which we're working. The end to which we're working is that all people hear the gospel and come to faith. Uh, and our part of it is that they hear the gospel. So, bring people into the church. See to it that they're properly catechized into the faith. Now, realize that we can't water down doctrine. Actually, know what our doctrines are. Um, you know, it's not like you got to take a test and know it overnight. This stuff grows and builds. But the basic idea is pretty simple. Um, and that's it. What a lot of churches are doing today, and they're, what they're doing is they're, they're, they're serving addicts. They're, they're serving people that are tripping on their own endorphins because they make them feel good by however ways they do. They make them feel good, and they want to keep feeling good, so they keep coming back to that church. I mean, I want people to feel good here, but I'm going to make you feel miserable before I make you feel good because I'm going to tell you you're a sinner. We don't like hearing that. 